Hello, good to see you all. Senator, you're now live. Thank you. We are now live. Okay, this is Senate Finance, and we are continuing our work, kind of um, trying to figure out what is happening with the Ed Fund, what our alternatives are, um, and then at the end of the day, we are going to take a look at that Interfund borrowing. I'm not quite sure how that's gonna make it on the Senate calendar or if the Senate is gonna to meet tomorrow, um, but it is something that has a timeline for the treasurer to keep us in balance. So um, we're gonna start out with Mark Peralt and Mark, you're gonna give us some more updates and projections and your name came up when we were talking to the towns and their request that we uh, suspend the 8% penalty if they don't turn in all their property tax um, and said that you could help us understand the impact. Okay. 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 I'll try. I'm uh, Mark Perot from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I thought I would start out by first reminding you where we think we are in FY20. Then I can give you some um, additional information on some work we've done looking forward into FY21. And then I can address um, VLCT's uh, proposal to have the state borrow to cover any okay. revenue shortfalls next year. So um, I think we've already talked about 2020 in here a little bit. So just to reiterate, we think that because of the $89 million shortfall in non-property tax revenues coming into the education fund in 2020 below the January forecast, um, that we're looking at a $39.5 million shortfall. And that is a shortfall that exists after we've depleted the FY, um, the reserve that we expected, to, the surplus that we expected to have coming forward um, plus the entire stabilization reserve. Still $39.5 million short, that would be carried forward into FY21. And is My that assuming that all the property taxes that are owed in May, more or less, get paid? Yes, that, that assumes that all of the property tax revenues that we've anticipated for FY20 come in that's a much smaller issue. It's an issue, but it's a much smaller issue in FY20 because we're so far into the fiscal year. There isn't right. that much money left outstanding to collect. So we're not, anticipating. you know, it'll be an issue for towns, but in terms of the education fund itself, it's probably not a huge issue given the size of the other numbers we're looking at. But yes, that $39.5 million assumption assumes all of the education tax money comes in. Okay. Okay. And now, I think we're pretty sure it won't, but. Right. Now, my understanding is that um, the, the state treasurer, Beth Pierce, has indicated that the state has a cash position that is good enough to allow for us to get through FY 2020. So bills are going to get paid for FY 2020, even though that deficit may be carried forward into FY 21. Bills will get paid this year. Okay. okay. It also assumes that all of the money that was deferred for the meals and rooms tax and the sales and use tax comes in in FY 20. Okay, and I think the administration has proposed allowing us to count any money that comes in through the month of July for those deferred taxes to be counted in FY20. So with all those assumptions in place, FY2020 looks like we're down $39.5 million. Okay, so right. if when the rooms and meals and sales tax get paid July 15th. Yep. That also that's going to be used to cover the deficit in 2020 that ended July 1st. And well, assuming that they all get paid, we still have a $39 million deficit. Correct. Okay. Okay. That's that, that that's 2020. Now going so the best that, case scenario is the treasurer will cover our debts yes. this year, yeah. but that if everything comes in 
as it should, as owed, mm -hmm. which is highly unlikely, yes. we still have a $39.5 million deficit. Right. And that's because the interfund okay. borrowing would need to be repaid, right? It's money yes. that's borrowed from another fund. It's got to go back at some point. So it's to get us through the year, but it doesn't address the whole. Okay. So then going, looking forward into FY21, first of all, I got to tell you that we do not have a reliable estimate yet for non-property tax monies that will come in in 21 compared to the January forecast. Okay. So for the numbers I'm talking about, I have assumed that we would collect 80% of the non-property tax revenues that we were anticipating in the January forecast. Okay, 90 that's basically sales tax. It's it's mostly sales tax, but it's also meals and rooms tax, okay? Yeah. Um, so let's see, so um, I've assumed that 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 loss, that loss amounts to about $114 million, okay? In addition to that, we would have the $39.5 million we've talked about in FY20 coming forward. Assuming that you want to fill the reserve in the education fund in FY21 back to the 5% statutory amount, that would be another $38 million. And school districts have already approved an increase in education spending of about $74 million. So, we're talking about a big, big hole um, in FY20. Based on those assumptions that I just gave you, the hole in the education fund next year would be, and so I'm not messing up, about 185 or $186 million. So it's huge. Um, yep, that's a big hole. That's a big hole. And the schools are getting that we could work a deal and the, they're getting somewhere around 30 million. From okay, the that's right. So I, I haven't discussed at all the, it's about, it, there's a $30 million in the ESEA money coming from the feds. Yeah. The money is gonna bypass the education fund, go to the agency and then directly out to supervisory unions. The department gets to keep about 10% for administration and, and emergency. So there'll be $27 million available to school districts from that money. Mm -hmm. I, haven't I haven't included that at all in this analysis because I don't know when it will be received. I don't know if it's going to be used up for COVID-19 related expenses that are showing up now in this last quarter of the year. But that money is, is available, not reflected in here. So that, that's a piece of good news, but I haven't. So that this, yeah, this 30 million, we don't know how it's, yeah, where it's going, how it's going to the schools, how or when or where. But right. even if we plug that in, we've still got to, you know, and even if we don't fill the reserves, we've still got over a hundred million dollar deficit. Yeah. And again, would you that, shut school for a year? <laughs> I don't know. And again, <laughs> keep in mind that assumes, and this gets to the VLCT issue, this assumes that all of the property tax money that we were assuming we would get back in January comes in. So this assumes that the December one property tax parameters that were recommended by the tax commissioner and the tax revenue that was associated with those parameters comes into the education fund. So, um, okay, about, so the town's collected, they pay it in December and June, right? Yeah, the cash flow is actually really complicated, but- um, Okay, it's, yeah. It's, if you just briefly, Municipalities are the taxing entities. So they raise the money. Where the money goes from there depends on how much money the town raises and how much the school spends. Some of the money ends up getting paid into the education fund. Some of the money goes directly to the school district. Right. So that's, that's why it's, it's tough to track this late in the year, even though we only have an April 30th payment left. Um, it's the, the April 30th payment, it's one third of the money due from the ed fund, but a lot of districts have already received their allocation from their municipality because the money has to be remitted from the municipality to the school district within 20 days of collection. So it's a really, it's a really complicated revenue flow, but yeah. Madam Chair. Yes. Could I just ask Mark, I, I'm assuming this is the case, but in your FY20 projections, have we spent all the reserves? Yeah, that $39.5 million hole assumes that 
we use up about a $13 million surplus that we were anticipating, plus the entire stabilization reserve, which was about 36.4, plus now we're down another 36 point, or another 39.5, yes. And so the, going in, that, that, that scenario I laid out assumes that we go into FY21 <laughs> with the cupboard empty. And the federal money, while we're still learning more about it, that is, uh, meant to be applied to the coming year. Is that true? Or do they care? I, I, I don't know. I think the money could be in the regulations or the, the law that I looked at, it said it could be used in FY20 or FY21, but I'm not sure how it's going to be used. All I know is that it goes to AOE and then directly to the supervisory unions bypassing the education fund. So whether that money gets used to address additional costs that districts have faced this year dealing with COVID-19 problems since they set their budgets last year, or whether that money is available for use in FY21, I don't know at this point. So I've just left it alone for now, but there is $27 million there that we can count on. Yes. Okay. But that's still something of a drop in the bucket at this point. And, but I guess the information we need right now is, and we can um, have our folks back in next week, but um, what is school spending looking like now? I mean, they're doing some things extra, but they're not doing other things. And what's an interim look at school budgets uh, this year mm -hmm. so that we can start getting a, a full picture for the demand next year. Yeah, and that, that, that applies for F, FY20 since we don't know exactly how much they're gonna end up spending this year, but it also applies to FY21. Although almost all districts have voter approved budgets, in most cases, schools have not closed negotiations with the teachers union over what um, teacher salaries and non um, health care benefits will be next year right. so we're, not, we're uncertain on both on both in both years exactly where spending is going to come in yes well, you know we need it at least for this year and figure out if schools are running ahead of budget behind budget and um, how many yep. so that we need that's we're missing that i think we can assume but um i have expressed concern that senator white isn't hearing me about giving towns blanket authority to reduce interest in penalties mm -hmm. um because if I think if they do it on an individual basis, it's fine. But if they do it on a one, on a, on a town wide, you know, we're just going to postpone. That means some people who can pay won't pay. Right. And we need to make sure we're getting as much money in here as we can. Right. So, um, because the towns normally, make sure they collect that because they have to pay us an 8% penalty if they don't. Right. But they're asking us to forgive the 8% penalty and then put any borrowing expense on to us. Right. So we're, we're negotiating, I yeah. think. So I, I think that VLCT is, has identified a real issue. We, we flagged this a couple of year, weeks ago in the issue brief, and that is that the municipalities act as the agent for the state in terms of collecting the property tax. So they collect the municipal property tax. They also collect the education property tax. They have authority to abate, um, delay you know, penalties and all that kind of stuff on the municipal side, but not on the education fund side because they're just acting as an agent. So even if they don't collect from their residents, if they don't collect some of the property tax they're owed, they remain on the hook for the education fund payment that, that either would go into the education fund or directly to their school districts. So that's a problem because they, they've got a double whammy there. They lose their municipal property tax money and they have to find the education tax money in order to pay it into the education fund. The way that that is dealt with 
um, now when towns are short is they can go out and short term borrow. So the 8% penalty is a penalty nobody should run into. If you can go out and borrow for much less than 8% right. and make that payment. The, the problem as I see it, and I haven't delved too, too far into this with the VLCT proposal of having the state borrow for that, is that first of all, we have no idea how much we would need to borrow. We don't know how, how delinquent taxpayers are gonna be in terms of paying in FY21. In FY20, the issue's taken care of. So in FY21 is really what we're talking about. We don't know how many taxpayers will be deficient. And it's gonna vary widely, I imagine, between yeah. communities. We have over 250 individual taxing entities out there. And to have them all making this decision independently is just, just seems to me to be inviting a, a whole lot of chaos into the process. Because yeah. you're gonna have two, 259 different decision makers deciding about who, is, who is, has a hardship or who and can't pay versus who has a hard time paying but may be able to. So there may be other ways to prevent a huge property tax increase from hitting taxpayers next year that doesn't has to have to involve um, providing, um, protecting the municipalities from having to pay that money on time. It may okay. be that you could, you could, you could for example, if, if it's allowable, and we don't know yet because the guidance is not in fully, but it's possible that some of that CARES Act money could be used to assist property taxpayers in coming up with the money they need to pay their property taxes in FY21 which would relieve the municipalities of the problem of not having that money to remit. So there are, there are other ways that may be able to address this problem that are a lot cleaner mm -hmm. than trying to have the state borrow and deal with this on a, on a you know, 250 plus entity, entities making decisions going forward. Does, does that make sense? This, this gets it really makes a lot of sense. Okay. But it, we're still waiting, I guess, to hear what the strings attach to the Cares. Yeah, the, the, the CARES Act money, I've, I've been told that we're, we should find out this week or early next week, we should have more guidance on that. The National Governors Association has recommended language that would allow us to use that money to, to offset COVID-19 related tax increases. And if that language were adopted, I think you could use some of that money to offset this $185 million shortfall in the education fund next year but you can okay. do it by by lowering the rate rather than trying to deal with this you know uh very piecemeal piecemeal that would that would definitely be ideal um because it it's it's going to take different sec parts of the economy a while to come back mm -hmm. some may come back right away some and mm -hmm. We could we could be shut down again next fall. We don't know, so it is a time of uncertainty. All right. Anything else? Good. Well, that was good news. <laughs> the bear of bad we might news. be able to borrow it. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. Um, that Mark, that question Mark, mark comes out backwards, uh -oh. you know, when you hold it up. We're getting near. Uh, Mark, Mark gave us a dollar figure for what the public schools were likely to get um, from the feds. And it, 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 is it is that all the money that's been spent sent to the, to the state of Vermont for education, or is that just the share going to K through 12? Um, that that is the sec the amount of the K through 12 money that would go directly to SUs. The total amount is about $30 million, but the Agency of Education, would they be able to retain some of that money for administrative costs and for emergencies? And there's also another small pot of about $4.5 million that the governor has discretion over. However, that money has to be split between higher ed and elementary and secondary education and education-related entities, which I'm not sure what that is. But anyways, it's, a, it's money that would get spread out more broadly. And, Mark, and the isn't figure, there an equal amount going to higher ed or relatively an equal amount? Yes, I think it's, it's a little bit less. I think last time I looked at it, it was about 22 or $23 million that would go directly to higher education. Yes. So that's, is, we know how that's we know if that's state schools or. Yeah, I, I, I haven't tracked it. I've been just I've been focusing on the K through 12 okay. um, stuff. So I, I can't really answer that question. Stephanie may be able to answer that for you. Okay. 
Sandra Campion, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to have interrupted, Madam Chair. I was just wondering That's how fine. that might be divided between the state colleges and UVM. I think it was the same question you had. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, just, we, and it, or it may be going yeah. to private colleges too. Senator Baruth. Yeah, we heard from the higher ed people yesterday and they are getting equivalent amounts um, and it's divided depending on how many Pell Grants you have and there's a an algorithm that um, generates your total that way. So okay. uh, there's a, we we got sent a list of what all the various colleges are getting. Okay. Does that include the independents as well? Sorry? Does that include independents? Yes. So the private colleges are getting it as well? Yes. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, I'll send it, uh, or I'll have Jeannie send it, one or the other. Have Jeannie, have your people send it to our people and we'll all get it. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Just holler because I have to switch screens. Okay. Mark, are you ready to pass the baton over to Steve? I am. Okay. Maybe it's more like a hot potato. Okay, Steve, you're muted. And yeah, and I, I'm go. just going to add a teeny bit of color, but it's uh, Mark really is the detail person. So in the last, since our last meeting, we've been following up with the treasurer. One possibility would be to um, not take over the loans as the VLC suggested, but to offer to, to subsidize the any sort of interest they have to pay for short-term borrowing or a percentage of the interest, because there's a pretty strong likelihood, and we checked with a bunch of other comptrollers in other states, that interest would be deductible <laughs> if you have to borrow money for because of the coronavirus. So that's, that's pretty much covered so that the loans could still be as needed by the um, local communities. And we would, uh, from what I understand, the treasurer has worked with uh, uh, the banks and there's a receptivity on the part of the banks to make the loans. And if we were to help them with the interest payments, that that would be a more normal course of what we could do. Uh, so that's one of the third throw that out there as a that's for this year that would be for this year and then yeah. um it's unclear yeah. whether you whether you need what you know next year whether you continue it or whether you just use it this year and then have to think of an, a similar or different system for the coming year i think we're um, assuming that there will be more people not paying their property taxes next year right and i think that's what uh mark was talking about do we do we uh uh, find some way, and I don't think yet we can um, use the coronavirus relief money to uh, pay for uh, a property tax um, subsidy. But but that's something we're looking at. I think we don't. I don't know if that's a, okay. a definite at this point. Um, but it would be a possibility. So okay. <clears throat> we're yeah. still waiting for guidance from Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not just Washington. Yeah, I guess in, it's a funny situation because there are three real rules that, that this money is bound by the CRF money. One is it has to be for expenditures essentially uh, related to the coronavirus or the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It has to be for expenses occurred, incurred between um, or actually between March 1st and December 31st of this coming year. And uh, the third thing, it can't be for things that are, there's already been appropriations made to cover. And those are sort of the three uh, limited walls we know of now. How those are interpreted, you know, how much flexibility is pretty much up for grabs. And we, we haven't seen the guidance, but the word is the guidance will not be dispositive. So what you have happening both in our office, <coughs> excuse me, and um, the treasurer and the fifth floor is we're all talking to our um, counterparts in other states and trying to find with well, the concept of their safety in numbers. If like five or six or seven states decide to do one thing, then people say, well, hmm, maybe we can do that because the odds of, you know, somebody coming down and saying those seven states are the wrong go down. And so it's, it's not, it's a very fluid situation. There's not a lot of clarity and okay. uh, it's a problem. Okay. Sandra Pearson, I Steve. See your hand. <clears throat> Thank you, Anybody Steve. Um, I keep asking this uh, with different experts in the seat, but we haven't appropriated a single dollar for FY21. 
And so by this, the layman's description you've offered, we could stick the whole money into our general fund based on the idea that we hadn't appropriated it yet. Surely that's not the case, but can you just help me understand to the extent you, you understand at this point, um, those so, really basic elements? Yeah, so the thing is, there are three things. One is it has to be for expenses that haven't been appropriated, which you just talked about. It has to be for pieces that are essentially expenditures related to the COVID virus um, outbreak. So, uh, and it has to be in this sort of a time limited. So if we've already, if we just put in our general fund and use it for random stuff, that wouldn't meet the test of essentially related to COVID virus. We, we couldn't track back that. So there is a lot of, what we're going to do is keep it as a separate fund like we did with ERA years ago. And it'll be listed as uh, CRF you know, funds. And every time we appropriate it, we'll know pretty much what we're appropriating it for because that, we have to track it separately. So that's helpful. So it's, I, I have heard that it was one of three things, but you're saying it's a three-part test. That, as, as, that is the so one far. we, yes. And, now, uh, are, are you obviously, I'm assuming you're inquiring whether or not drops in revenue, which are directly related to the crisis, would be a COVID related expense, right? No, and then that's, that's the really a big problem. Yeah. Every advocacy group is trying to change the rules on that, but revenue drops are not an expense. So it can't be used to make up for revenue loss. And that's the problem with, if we just, um, cover you know a revenue decline um under current rules nobody thinks that that's coverable and there's been some direct guidance from the congressional research service um from other people indicating that's the case that we cannot use the money for that so steve is that true for um covid19 related revenue increases as a as as opposed to losses? That, so this is the thing my understanding is that if you're so explain to me what you mean by COVID virus 19 well, really revenue increases. Property taxes is going to go up by 20 cents next year. That's a COVID-19 related impact. And yep. can we use that money to provide some assistance to taxpayers to avoid that COVID-19 related expense? Expense. That, if if uh, you can say the word expense. Yes, then, sorry. <laughs> well, one word. Uh, sure. you're just if you're avoiding an expense, then you're, right. um, you're then you, you have a little bit firmer territory than if you're Sub, you know, you want to be away from the revenue. Yeah, I think what you're saying, if property, if if the costs are going up, and you need to cover those costs, and you cover it with this money, you have a better case than if you're covering a um, uh, a revenue loss. So, um, it, it's in a gray area. Okay, I, I I'd see it as more than I'd see it as charcoal gray, because. <laughs> Yeah. If, yeah. if you're covering just basic school expenses, the costs have gone up because they voted the costs to go up back in March. Right, right. The costs are going up. The property taxes are going to have to go up because we've lost revenue due to COVID. The, the other problem we've lost is we revenue. Can't, yeah, the other problem is we can't cover things that are unrelated to the COVID virus. I mean, the, sort of the three pieces are that um, it's an expense, that it's in, it's related to COVID virus. So if it's just to cover um, increasing costs in the education world, that would not be my interpretation. I, you know, I, you know I, you, my sense of the ledge council if they're online can talk more about this, but those are our problems. Right. If you don't have that, the, you have those three conditions basically. Now, hopefully, there is a COVID four in the works, and right. we're small change when it comes to lost revenue, just in total dollars. Um, so, other states are. Yeah, really everybody's pushing, pushing for a change. Yeah, and um, but you know we're sort of living in the world now, so most of the ideas by using the CRF money are related to covering expenses that could be related to COVID that are, um, that have come out and you, and you, and you can be pretty, you know, housing for 
homeless people who have been yeah. affected and maybe, you know, what about broadband? You know, it's a big need, you know, yes. You know, the, there's a, there's broad, you can, you know, everything's, in sh as you said, there's shades of gray, reading, reaching to charcoal and, and black, and you want to sort of, but the education world, distance learning, clearly, um, the broadband need that they have, yeah. you know, um, some additional costs, feeding costs, things like that. It's when you get into replacing revenue, you're sort of a little bit on the other side of the line at this point. However, paying interest um, that wouldn't have been needed to do if it wasn't for COVID is something that most people feel is coverable. So if you have to borrow to pay yeah. the state, yeah, then that should be deductible. Senator Perchlick, and I'm looking yeah, for, for Steve, like a question during the ARA era, they had a very specific a prohibition on supplanting and yep. is that kind of the same what you're that they're saying here about replacing revenue yeah yeah that and they didn't use the word supplant but they said anything that's already been appropriated or any bill that's already been passed before march uh before the date of the passage of the act which i think was march uh 27th i'm not sure mm -hmm. uh uh that that is an issue okay so you're right it's very similar well, but we were able to address that issue, even though it's very similar, simply by reducing the general fund transfer for two years by an equivalent amount of the money 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 going to the supervisor. We, we didn't have that. We, we you know, it was a prospective issue. And so then you get into this question of, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get ahead of my knowledge and I probably am. I don't remember exactly how we handled that in era, but we clearly did. Uh, I, and I think we may have been the growth in spending, but um, I don't know if they did the same thing where bills or things passed prior to a date. It was more of a general supplantation language. And it may have been different on how the two were structured. The, they have the same concept, but they're very different language in the two bills. Mm -hmm. We would have to go back and find out what the differences were. Maybe Bill okay. Talbot knows. I don't know. He's, he was involved in that too. Okay. I think if we haven't got any more questions for Steve, um, I know that Secretary French and the folks from the Department of Education are here, so we can, yeah, we're only three minutes behind time, so we can move on to them unless Steve just built. No, nope, that's fine. Okay, so we will move on to Secretary French and switch my screens. Welcome. And Brad and Bill Bates. And welcome. I know we had you in last week. You were just starting to work on all these wonderful issues. Um, and just wanted to have you back and talk to us about what you were thinking at this point. Um, we're sure you found a way to bail us all out of this. What is it? One hundred and eighty six million dollar hole. <laughs> so the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. It's Dan French, Secretary of Education. I have uh, Bill Bates, uh, who's our CFO at the agency, and Brad James, who's an Education yeah. Finance Manager. Mm -hmm. um, we did prepare sort of a written summary of our thinking to date uh, for you. Hopefully, the committee members have a copy of that. Um, uh, if you send it in, it is posted on the website, yeah. so everyone can. I'll just, it. I'll just walk through it a little bit. Um, you know, so those comments uh, Steve was making previously. Yeah, we're going to have unanticipated costs for sure as a result of COVID-19. I think it's early to say, you know, where those areas of costs will become the greatest, but I think it's fair to say across the board, um, we will have increased costs with, uh, I'll call uh, student supports, you know, special education, mental health services and so forth. I think we, we are not far enough into this yet to understand the nature of those costs, but I think it's fair to say all districts will see increased spending in those areas, uh, particularly as the emergency winds down and um, districts are required to provision, make provision for what are called compensatory services uh, for particularly for disabled students who have fallen behind. So we know there's going to, the conclusion is we know there's going to be increased mm -hmm. costs more than what we know right now at this moment in time. The um, we have a better handle on CARES Act to a certain extent since we last talked. 
Um, in particular, uh, we know more about, uh, there's basically the two pots of money relative to education. One was the elementary secondary emergency relief fund. Not much new there other than to say, um, the talking with the, uh, the federal government on Monday, uh, they alluded to the fact that we could expect the guidance and the application specific specifics on, on that to be out uh, basically in a week and a half. Uh, they're required to get it out by the end of the month, but uh, might be out a little sooner than that. So we don't have any more specificity on how uh, those funds will uh, come down to the districts yet. Um, basically, we'll know here in a week or so. Uh, where we have more specificity on is the other pot of money, which is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Um, that Vermont's share of that is $4.4 million. Uh, the application uh, for those funds went live on Tuesday of this week. And um, just to recap, these, these funds are um, not necessarily dispersed through the SEA. They're, they're basically coming out from the governor's office somehow, or from more broadly from the office administration. Um, there's three areas it's designed to give governors some flexibility, but basically um, to address uh, the needs uh, of an LEA that was significantly impacted or LEAs have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, higher ed is an option um, as is an option to provide, um, direct those funds to be more broadly utilized to any education related entity in the state. Um, that was essential for carrying out the emergency services, uh, educational services for students. So <clears throat> it's pretty pretty wide latitude in, in that, and the application process is fairly streamlined. Um, we're in the early phases of uh, formulating that application. Um, I can say that the governor doesn't have specific priorities yet, um, but he has expressed an interest to work closely with the General Assembly on formulating those priorities. So okay. um, that's the one piece of the news we have on the CARES Act. Um, in terms of then, you know, just in the, my written test testimony, not, not giving you any answers per se, but uh, I think, you know, based on our thinking, um, the, we call policy considerations. Um, you know, firstly, uh, revenues from the CARES Act alone, it's not going to be sufficient um, to, to solve our problem at the state level yeah. or the broader state's condition. So it's important to acknowledge that even if all the CARES revenue was somehow allocated to uh, the whole in the Ed Fund, it wouldn't be, it would be significantly insufficient. Um, so therefore, we conclude um, in fiscal year 20 anyway, that someone's, someone's going to have to do some borrowing, basically, to fill the hole. Um, and we, we can envision, uh, we probed some ideas around the state doing the borrowing, uh, districts doing the borrowing, some version thereof where local municipalities are doing some short-term borrowing to fulfill their obligations to cover ed payments back to the districts. Um, and we didn't, we didn't play out in greater specificity of how that sort of second option of how um, CARES Act revenue basically could be redirected to the Ed Fund through some sort of build back provision or clawback approach. But we do know it is possible. It's just overly complex, just the mechanics of it. I want to say overly complex. This is more complex and um, also politically, you know, more challenging to enact. Um, but I think, you know, our conclusion is that, you know, borrowing will, borrowing will be necessary, obviously. Um, and lastly, we think, you know, fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22, when I say 22, I mean the budget process that districts would be engaged in in the coming fall. Um, we think it's important um, because we have this sort of bifurcation in our system where uh, local, um, local leaders make sort of the spending decisions, but the state basically takes care of the financing decision that uh, we think, you know, basically there needs to be frequent and regular communication about the fiscal context so we can get out, right out in front of the budget matching process at the local level, out in front of the collective bargaining process at the local level and so forth. So folks have the best information to make those decisions. So I mean, to, to bring that down to sort of a concrete recommendation, it would be something like having the December uh, tax commissioner's letter coming out in July or on a monthly basis through the summer so folks are aware of um, where we are uh, relative to new federal money coming in or the latest revenue projections and so forth. Um, but we'd start much earlier with, uh, with districts in that regard. It also helps inform how they can uh, use or how should they, should they use their CARES Act revenues, which 
um, my conclusion to superintendents. I was speaking to them on a statewide call uh, about 20 minutes ago or so. Um, if I were a superintendent, I'd be, you know, being very conservative with that funding with a focus on the need to, to be able to support uh, and pay for those uh, student supports that we have or know are looming out there on the horizon, but are going to show up from a budgetary and programmatic uh, perspective uh, very soon. Okay. Any questions at this point for Secretary French? Mm -hmm. I'm not. Madam Chair? Uh, yes, Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Brad or Bill is going to speak, Secretary French, but um, just want to ask you what your thoughts are on the FY, on what may be able to be done for the FY21 school budgets that have already been passed. We know that 19 haven't yet been dealt with and the education committee has been talking about that. But the school district, the rest of the budgets were passed just literally a week before all of this went down and um, wondering if the agency has talked about any possibilities for how we might address those on a more global perspective, given the situation with the education fund. Yeah, we haven't really yet. I mean, it's just due to the nature of this emergency situation. We, we I think in the last five days or so, have been really trying to delineate our thinking on fiscal year 20 versus 21. And I think, you know, as, as we've been, I think rightfully pointed to consider the fiscal year 20 situation first. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're gearing up to uh, deal directly with fiscal year 21. Um, we had an invite bot, Brad to chime in and Brad and Bill were both, I believe, both at the VASBO meeting, which is the uh, Association of School Business Officials, the business managers, basically. So there's a lot of give and take at those meetings uh, with AOE staff. Um, so I don't know, Brad or Bill, if you want to chime in in that regard. I can get unmuted. There we go. Um, we we haven't talked again. D Dan, Bill, and I have talked a little bit in the background about FY21, but it's primarily FY20 we're dealing with and how this CARES money is going to full play out. But when I was talking with business managers the other day, um, we were talking more in terms of what's happening currently as opposed to we know that's not going to be pretty next year. We did not really get into the idea of what could possibly be done with the budgets. They're all aware that budgets can be brought back um, by, by the board. Although, again, as I've said to a number of people, that's probably not a very good idea because it could easily go south um, in, in, a, in a really bad way uh, by opening budgets back up. Um, so right, right now, um, the, the folks who have passed their budgets, that's kind of where they stand at the moment. Uh, there is there is talk, and, and really, I would, I would leave it up to Senator Ruth to talk about it more, but there is there is discussion as to what to do about the 18, I guess it's 19 districts that do not have budgets, nine of whom failed their budgets on town meeting day, one who postponed it because I think, I can't remember if it was town meeting day or right after, because of COVID-19, and the others who have not yet had a budget vote. So there's talk about what to do with them. Um, but otherwise, we haven't really gotten to the point where what are we going to really seriously talk about what people have already voted on in, in the past? Yeah. Well, I think at some point, we're going to have to set a tax rate, a yield. And I don't think it's going to be very pleasant news, <laughs> uh, <laughs> given <laughs> what we know. That is an um, understatement, Madam Chair. I am sure it is. Uh, so I, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I it, just wanted it, to a follow up on. Um, sorry, okay, Senator and then Hardy. I've got Senator Pearson. So Senator Hardy oh. and then Senator Pearson. No, that's a follow up. Thank you. It's just a follow up on that. I, I, I bring it up um, because obviously we need to be thinking about FY21, but also school districts, while they have passed their budgets, many of them are in the midst of still figuring out the cost of their contracts for next year. And um, mm -hmm. that will that will quickly, the opportunity to make adjustments there will quickly uh, go away if we delay too long. Um, so uh, we have we have just a small window before many of those contracts will be finalized, and um, 
and and therefore uh, unchangeable. So I just you know think we have to have that conversation now we, rather sooner rather than later. We did try and have that conversation. I think I can say we got a mixed reaction. Uh, I'd say the superintendents understand the issues. The NEA weren't quite as receptive. Principals were in the school boards were kind of in the middle. So I, I, I think we have to agree this is not the time to talk about level funding and not giving people raises on the other hand the numbers, the money isn't there right now. And it's going to be very expensive for the people who can pay to fill that hole. So um, that's an issue. Sandra Pearson. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would offer that we barely scratched and began to have that conversation in passing and probably need to find a, a different way of organizing that conversation. But uh, you you mentioned, Madam Chair, that we're going to have to set a yield rate and it's going to be unpleasant. I, I think I would offer it's going to be untenable mm -hmm. uh, for us to ask for a big property tax increase when a quarter of our workers are un, unemployed. Right. Um, I hear Mark, I see Mark offering uh mcdonald <laughs> so i Oops, I better I, switch screens curious, what's he I'm, doing he'll have to unmute when he gets called on but i i just think i don't pretend to know what the solution is but um we ha are in a real bind and yeah. um, w i think we owe it to ourselves to outline a process uh we owe it to the districts to outline a process with some timeline and uh, I don't know that we need to do that here right now, but um, I don't think we pretty can. quickly, we, we, we're, we're gathering a lot of information. It's all bad news. And um, that's going to become apparent if it's not already. What is less apparent is, is a timeline and uh, even a, a commitment to, um, from the legislature to, to try to come up with a solution. Mark, has anyone calculated if we had to do a tax rate on what we know now with a $39.5 million deficit, what would that tax rate look like? Maybe that would get people's attention. Oh, you're muted. I don't have it in front of me. We would need to calculate it. We could do it. What we have looked at is leaving the um, December one yields in place, which would have re required a five cent or a six cent increase in okay. property tax rates in 21, depending on whether you're homestead or non-homestead, and assume that all that money came in and then look at the gap that needs to be filled from there. But um, at 185 million, it's about eight and a half million dollars per penny. So um, that's a lot of pennies. Yes, it's a lot of pennies this time. Um, Senator McDonald, you are, uh, they said this morning someone was going apoplectic. I think you're there. It, we keep referring to the property tax. Yes. Instead of the local education taxes. Yes. And when you set a tax rate for next year, what is going to be noticeably different is the local education taxes paid by people who pay on income, which probably represents, um, Mark Peralt will give, uh, give me a better number, which probably represents 70% of Vermonters. That next year, 80% of Vermonters, maybe 82% of Vermonters, will be eligible to pay their local education taxes based on income. And when you set a new rate, you have to take into account that that group of people is going to be larger and will owe less yes. before, you, before you set the rate. And so that, that issue actually gets complicated because 
the property tax adjustment that people receive in 21 is going to be based on their household income in 2019. Okay. Exactly. Or any of this happened. So they're going to get a property tax adjustment that doesn't do a lot for them. That will be made up in 22. Year after. Sort of, uh, um, not great news for a taxpayer to find out that you're going to, you know, you're going to get your aid, but you're not going to get it for another year out. And then back to Senator Cummings, your original question, a quick calculation is that tax rates based on all the assumptions I laid out, which include 80% of collections of non-property taxes and all that kind of stuff. And all the things we've gone over be about a 21 cent increase over the five cent increase that was already recommended. So um, 26 cents. Okay. Yeah, so 25, 26 cents. It's just, it's just enormous. So my question is, when the, the number that Mark has just given us, is that based on a recognition that perhaps 80% of people or more will be paying based on their incomes? Or does it assume that the same number of people are paying based on their incomes? Yeah, in, in FY21, they will not be paying based on their incomes. They will, be, they will get a property tax bill that's based on that 25 or 26 cent increase and they will reduce that by the property tax adjustment that was determined based on their income back in 2019. Correct. So they will they will they, they will get wet and hit hit with the full freight of this thing just like a, somebody who pays right. the rate. In 22 <laughs> hopefully they'll be back to work and their incomes will be up and they'll get a rebate <laughs> that year. But right. that and then that, yes. that means that in 22, the property tax adjustment, you could expect a little bit of a spike in there. Right. Although that will be mitigated somewhat because um, unemployment insurance and other cash payments from the government count towards your household income. So it will be offset a little bit, but I would expect a jump in there. So we're looking at a problem that's, you know, several years rolling out. Before it rolls out. And there's, I mean, there's virus repeats and all kinds of other things that we don't know and can't control. But right. that 10% might be the 10% most likely to have difficulty because their incomes, higher income folks, that $600 is not going to make up mm -hmm. what they were earning and what their mortgage and their expenses and everything else is based on. Those are the folks that might have the most trouble um, paying their property taxes. And um, I think one of the things we might do is work with the towns to come up with rather than forgive, but work out the, the league talked about doing a payment um, plan with taxpayers. And I think we might want to talk with them about what that payment plan would look like and so that we could get some predictability as to when those taxes were likely to come in and how much, if it's not $200, if $50 can come in per payment, at least we know what's coming in. So um, that's something to, to look at with them. So we need to talk about payment plans. All right. Okay. And I'm here. Yes, oops, next um, screen, yes. <laughs> um, for the folks uh, from AOE on the screen, uh, on the call, can has there been any discussion with the tax department to your knowledge or have you been involved in it that might um, help us address this year lag? I mean, I know we've always been frustrated with the fact that your income could change and you wouldn't see that reflected in your income sensitivity for another year. But, uh, but we have had a um, sort of process for people to call and file um, 
I forget the, the term, but basically get a forgiveness or, or some kind of mitigation strategy on a one-to-one -one basis. And it just strikes me that if we leave it alone and just shrug away this problem, that the tax department will be completely swamped with these requests. And we might be wise to set up some kind of uh, uh, maybe even in a short-term way for one year, uh, a process where we have a way of honoring that. Anybody aware of those kinds of conversations within anywhere in the administration? Uh, I am not. Um, I don't know if Brad, you've had any, but uh, we can certainly convey that. No, no, I'm not. Nor, nor am I familiar with what you're talking about in terms of, for lack of a better term, a waiver of a year or something like that. Well, the the tax commissioner can um, give people some kind of hardship. Yeah. Way out, at least on some taxes. I assume that can apply to property tax too, although I'm not. Okay. Sure of that. okay. Yeah, I, it I, can, and uh, it's a tax advocate but we might want to talk about submitting and getting a payment plan you know is is much more wholesale than than trying to do this on one on one um okay Brad did you have something no no, no nothing specific um, okay. at the moment okay anybody else I'm flipping screens Okay, Senator Ballant. Just briefly to go back to something um, that Brad said um, during his presentation. Um, you said, we don't want, and I'm paraphrasing here, we don't want to go back and start opening up budgets that have already passed because mm -hmm. things would quickly go sideways and unravel. And I think many of us can imagine what you mean, but I'd love for you to just make it a little bit more explicit when you say that, what's, what's the fear there? Because we're well, in a different economic situation than we were in a month ago. Everything has changed, not just in Vermont, but nationally and globally. So talk, talk me through that a little bit more so, if you could. So, so I think right now, based on the budgets that have come in, and this is including the budgets that failed and went down, the ones that haven't yet voted, the, the average statewide Increase was 4.2 was 4.4 percent in education spending. Um, so I think had those budgets votes been taking place three weeks later, a month later, I don't think the the that as many budgets would have passed as did. Um, obviously, the budgets were built long before this was thought of uh, because budgets were being built back in November, December, and January is when they're starting starting to be finalized. I think if, if, if boards were to go back and say we would like to lower education and therefore, i.e. our budgets, which will drive your education spending, generally speaking, um, I think one of the things that might happen is that if they're opening those up and then they have to revote them, people are going to say, no, that's still too much. And at that point, they've already passed the, 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 the timelines for, um, for reductions in force with the teachers and other staff members, that mm -hmm. that that time has passed. So they're going to they're going to run into their contract issues. I think mm -hmm. they're not going to have places to cut their budgets really without directly impacting uh, probably critical services to the kids, is my guess. Because there's you know the the, the numbers that you hear thrown out are 75, 80 percent of a budget is is um, right is, uh, in benefits. No. Can I jump in here for a second? Yep. Is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, just because a district budget, budget spending for the year and voters approve it does not mean that that money has to be spent. Correct. That, no, right? it, 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 it does not. And, and um, one of the things I heard from one of the federal webinars that I was on a while ago was their recommendation to school districts was to save the reserves this year and use them next year, try to blow them. Mm -hmm. But you're right, Mark, they do not have to spend what they budget. They can they can cut back on wherever wherever they possibly can. Again, I don't know where they can cut back. Well, what, what I'm thinking about, if you still have teacher contracts open, I understand that the, the negotiations have closed on health care, which results in about a $25 million increase. Right. But talking about a $73 million increase overall. And as you point out, salaries and benefits are like four fifths of the total cost. So it seems to me that if you have 
most contracts that still have not been settled, there's a really short window. It's short, but there is a window there for some potential savings at the district level. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of what, what contracts are out there that are not settled. That was the first I'd heard that most contracts are not settled due to the uh, health care settlement from the, the, the health care part settled. But what I heard as of and this is this is changing day by day, but I heard as of uh, a week or so ago that only three um, districts had closed negotiations with teachers and the rest of them are remaining open. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that. I don't know. Okay. Okay, I got Senator McDonald and then Senator Baruch. Perhaps um, in, in order to try and deal with uh, the, the 18 budgets that haven't been established, um, we could ask Mark Peralt to apply, just as an exercise, to apply the average increase to all those school districts that, for, that the rest of the state had. And the reason I suggest we do that is because it might, we might find that we are going to take a look at all the school districts and squeeze them in the, in the months to come and squeeze them proportionally. And if we're gonna do that, um, the, the school districts that have not yet settled have to be in that group that may get squeezed. So I just, that's a step that we ought to deal with first before we have, we're going to decide how we're going to deal with everybody. That's my suggestion. Senator Baruth, I understand Secretary French has something. All right, we'll do Senator Baruth and then the Secretary. Okay. So as everybody remembers from the all Senate calls, we've, in Senate Ed, we've produced language to cover these 18 or 19 districts, I think 19 with Rivendell. Um, and the idea is that if they can't pass a budget, then they're level funded to last year. As a result of that, we got a small, you know, wave of mail. And this goes back to where we started. These districts are saying that they're now incurring increased costs. So they're frightened at the idea of a level fund to last year would force them to make very substantial cuts in uh, workforce and other things. So I guess my starting position is that if we can not go back into budgets that have already been voted, we should do that. If that means borrowing, if it means other things, though that strikes me as preferable. We could set up guidelines without uh, touching the budgets that have already been voted on we could set up guidelines for the following year's budgets that make it clear that they are going to need some of this money going forward. That's kind of a way of mm -hmm. having it both ways for us. Because they are getting $27 million. Yes. Um, to help cover those increased costs this year or I halfway through next year. So the schools do have some money coming in we, on the other hand, so far don't. Um, and a 26 cent tax increase is, how much blood have we shed over five cent increases or two cent increases? So I wanna to get to Secretary French oh. unless this is a follow-up. Uh, it no. is. The, the other thing quickly is, if you go back to Phil Scott's first year in office, we we had that big fight with him over what amounted mm -hmm. to a clawback from districts. And he wanted 26 million, we did 13 million. And that 13 million was so painful that we wound up, uh, you know, we wound up doing other things the following year as a result. So I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't squeeze the districts as Mark talked about, uh, but with that said, there's, there's a, a, a level of pain that those districts can absorb. And beyond that, I, I don't know that they can. So we would have to yeah. be extremely careful in those discussions. No, I, I agree. OK, Secretary French. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on uh, Senator Balin's question uh, and Brad's response. I think it'd be one thing if the voters uh, were 
could have an informed perspective at this point. I think so much, if the budgets were reopened now, so much of it would be emotional and mm -hmm. the anxiety. I think, I think the, um, in this issue that we don't, my prediction is we don't even know what the costs are gonna be yet as a result of the student support issues that are about, we don't even know that yet. I'm not, it doesn't worry me so much the I would say the incremental overages that districts are experiencing now, because I think there are offsetting revenues and, and they have some flexibility, but the new things that we're gonna be embarking upon and relative to student supports and so forth as a result of the emergency, we don't know yet. And I don't think the voters are gonna be in a position to contemplate that. I think that really points to school boards having to, as you've sort of concluded, I think the school boards are the ones that are need, gonna to need to navigate uh, the context as, as we can make it more clear for them. But to open up the budgets now, I think would just, you know, to the question about, well, what's opening that can of worms? I think that's, that's my concern is that the voters wouldn't necessarily be well informed enough to do that. And what's in front of us in sort of an incremental reaction is really what the boards are going to have to wrestle with and rightfully so, because they're the ones that uh, have that ability to understand the impact on the whole system. And so much of what we've asked districts to do in the last several weeks is the new uncharted territory, new work. And uh, I worry about just sort of incrementally or blindly politically reacting to cutting programs and stuff right when we're asking schools to serve a central purpose and the stability of our society in this emergency. So it's going to be a challenge, but I'd, I'd prefer is, school and boards I, navigate I think that. We, there, there is the whole question of, and how do you vote on a town-wide basis? Sure. We haven't quite had a run through with having the house vote and that's only 150 people. We know how long it took us to do three or four non-controversial bills doing just having to do roll call um, to adjourn and uh, how it might be a good run through for the elections next fall if mm -hmm. we're not able to be out by then. But there's other issues. Uh, school boards are, this is not an ideal format for deliberation and <laughs> negotiations. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I follow up, Anne? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where Just are you? There you are. Um, Turn the bell. And I don't, I don't want my question to be misconstrued as me advocating for opening up school budgets. Just to be clear, I'm right. just thinking this through because in so from where I sit in in Brattleboro, my kids go to the. Uh, to one of the districts that has not yet settled its budget. And it hasn't settled its budget because we don't have town meeting until the third week in March. And of course we didn't have our town meeting and all of that stuff. And so the, the reason why I ask it, the conditions have changed. So we're asking that district essentially to take a level funded budget because we know more now, right? It, will there be an inflator? That's my question, Senator we're, Bruce. We're not asking them to take a, uh, if I may. Yes, we're, please. We're not asking these districts to take a level funded budget. What we're saying is if you don't manage to pass your budget, then you have the level funding, which is preferable to what's in law now, which would be 87% borrowing capacity of last year's budget. Mm -hmm. so, so what we're saying is yeah. you, you still have the option going forward, even past June 30th, to pass your budget. If you don't manage to do it, we're just swapping out the default for a more attractive option for them. Mm -hmm. So, so they are they are still welcome to pass their budget. If they can't for some reason, they will mm -hmm. get instead of 80 for 87 percent of last year's plus interest borrowing costs, they will get 100. Mm -hmm. So our, our legislation makes your district better off and doesn't take away any of their power to pass a budget. Well, and we can take, I, I think that is mostly mm -hmm. true. I have some concerns, but we don't have to talk about it now. Okay. What's not true? What, I mean, that's. No, that's accurate, right? No, 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 I'm saying it's, it's what you're saying is accurate. I'm not saying, oh. I, I'm not at all talking about the accuracy of what you just said. I just think it's more complicated. That's what I'm saying, but we can talk about it offline. I don't want to take time within the committee. It's to always that. more complicated than yeah. that. That's the motto of the Health and Welfare Committee. <laughs> okay. Um, any other, uh, Senator Pearson? Uh, I, I guess I have a question for Mark Perrault and then one for Secretary French. Mark, 
you said uh, schools don't have to spend the amount that they've budgeted. Uh, and I think we all understand that. My question to you is, does the Ed Fund and the state have to send them the money of the budget that's passed? Um, I guess that's a legal question. I'm not sure. I, I assume that we, we do, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Brad shaking his head, maybe he does. Okay, Brad, you want to, have you got an answer? No, because I'm not a lawyer, but I think my understanding of how the law, the, the way the language is written is yes, they, they do, the Ed Fund does have I to send we that did. regardless. And just, just one quick point, um, just to clarify that, and th this is the beauty of, you know, cell phones where people can send you texts while you're talking on, on this, um, is that, that when, when there are contractual obligations, they, they have to be paid the following year. So that's yeah. kind of going back to what I was saying. Salaries and benefits will pretty much be done at that point. Um, right. Cut the yeah. any any yeah. reductions will have to come elsewhere, or people will be borrowing. Oh, you, yeah, you have to lay off personnel, which so is going to Senator Pearson's yeah. question. I, I think I think the Ed Fund is I think the state is obligated under current language to send that money out. That's well, what I've well, no, that's know, what I've always been told, because before Act sixty, when we were doing grants. Um, the state didn't always pay the full grant if the state didn't have the money and the schools were left hanging. So I think, and I'll look to Senator McDonald, who's my historian, that that was part of the deal is that if the state said they were sending you X amount, they had to send you X amount. They couldn't say, well, we don't feel like it because we don't have it. For years, that's exactly what happened. And the current law is as Brad has stated it. And the legislature can say notwithstanding and then do what we what we choose to do prior to July 1st. And my comment about um, squeezing, freezing, or lavishing school districts is that we ought to settle the 19 schools and get them on the same playing field before we make the decision whether to freeze, squeeze, or lavish. And um, I think uh, the education committee has made a step in that direction by moving to the 100%. So. Okay. And then Secretary French, you said that you hoped school boards would make these decisions. Um, and so is that the agency's sort of operating uh, principle in terms of how we're going to address the, the huge shortfall in the next in next year's Ed Fund? Yeah, in our testimony, um, we're basically suggesting the future, the fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, the best approach there is to provide the boards uh, a very, you know, and certainly the broader communities, a very close understanding of the context that we're in. and. Uh, and I think in fairness to them, uh, we don't know fully that context yet. Uh, they certainly don't know, and we don't know the policy implications from a, just from an educational service delivery perspective, what the implications of this full uh, crisis will be in terms of how, what services they're gonna be asked to deliver. So to just, to pretend that it's just the regular budget process is normal and just figuring how to work in constraints, I think is only half, it's like two dimensional, where really the th third dimension of this is, there's a whole nother level of service definition that we haven't embarked upon, particularly compensatory services for disabled students and so forth, and increased mental health costs and that kind of, those kinds of considerations all need to be brought together. So I guess, our point would be provide all the information we can in terms of understanding the context in which they're going to be making those decisions. But we also, uh, just to do this in the most responsive way possible, need to empower uh, locals in their specific regional context to navigate this crisis. And each, each region and each district is going to be in a slightly different situation to a certain extent. Um, so I think, you know, that's the best we can do right now. And once again, I know that's sort of a superficial approach to sort of delineating fiscal year 20 versus fiscal year 21 and just sort of kicking that can down the road for a couple of months. But I think uh, that's our best thinking at the moment. And maybe we'll have new information from the federal government that would change that. But that's what that's what we're thinking right now. We're hoping. 
Okay. So right now for this year, the Agency of Education is just kind of letting it play out for now to see what's happening at the local district and um, waiting to see what kind of federal funds come in. But at some point, we're gonna have to make a decision um, about tax rates. And we've got a bunch of other decisions like the 8% and letting the towns off the hook and um, other deadlines. Well, we know, um the CARES Act will have a firmer handle on it in about 10 days. So we can certainly, you know, we're happy to come back next week on an update as well. But okay. to at least nail down some of these variables, I think would be helpful. So we'll we'll know more definitively, you know, that's what we've been are told you, by the U.S. Department of Ed. Are you talking to the schools at all about trying to gather information on what their spending looks like this year? Um because that would be helpful. I mean, if yeah. if they're spending more, or less, or the same just for different things, that would be one thing. If they're going to have, because they're getting some money, uh, sounded like a lot till we looked at the deficit, but um, they'll get some money, and uh, you know, it'd be helpful to know if that money's going to. They've already used it up this year and they're just going to be backfilling or, you know, what's going to happen next year. And just somebody needs to start getting that information for us. And Yeah, I think that's definitely up. something we can do. It's just, you, okay. get, it's, you understand it's a very dynamic situation right now. Oh, yes. Um, you know, firstly, just the, I think you can appreciate that we don't understand the federal, specific, the specific federal guidelines and we'll right. know that. But just the issue of, you know, to drill down on a specific issue that uh, the superintendents and business managers are looking for guidance from us now on the issue of uh, special ed reimbursement. I know you're all familiar with our reimbursement mm -hmm. formula in special education. We have just essentially in this paradigm of continuity of learning, redefined or reinvented the regular education learning environment for the rest of the school year for all intents and purposes. Oh, yeah. From there, we're starting to now dig into what is, how our student IP is going to be affected, what support systems are going to be necessary for students to be supported in that environment. Um, the issue, you know, we have an emergency order from an economic stability strategy that requires school districts to pay all their employees out for the rest of the school year. Some of those employees, particularly paraeducators, might have been providing special education services in accordance with the student's IEP. And therefore, 60% of those services, the cost of those services were reimbursed under our special ed reimbursement model. Districts are continuing to pay those employees as if those services were being delivered, but they're not necessarily being delivered right now um, or not being delivered in the same quantity or manner because the fundamental regular ed learning environment yeah. has been redefined. So they're asking us, well, we're okay, so we're making these expenditures because you're ordering us to do so as an economic stability measure. We need to know if, if they're going to automatically qualify those expenditures for the 60% reimbursement or not. You know, they're asking questions like that. Of course, it all comes out of the Ed Fund, but theoretically, part of that maybe could not be covered by CARES Act, and then we run into maintenance of effort issues, uh, supplanting issues. I mean, so there's a this stuff is not overly simple, and we don't know the patterns of their expenditures well enough yet uh, to determine. You know, it's not as simple as like calling them up and saying, "How's your budget running?" Because the budget's gone essentially, and now we're in a different different scenario altogether. But the good news, I think, is that every week that goes by, we get a lot more certainty on that. So I think if we if we take the CARES Act trajectory, meaning that we we are promised to have guidance on that within 10 days or so, we'll have more specificity on the financial condition of districts in 10 days as well. So I think, you know, by the end of April, we'll have, we'll be able to admire sort of the trajectory of where things are heading. And coincidentally, that's more or less the same timeline the governor's given me for making some decisions on end of year celebrations, graduations, and things like that. So we'll be getting closer to that May 15 deadline uh, where the stay at home order and so forth. So we'll start to be able to understand a little better how the rest of the school year is going to unfold at that point. So 
I would say, yeah, we're happy to get that information to you. It'd be premature mm -hmm. for us to try to give it to you tomorrow. Oh yeah, um, no, but I, think, I just, I think, I think we're we certainly inspire the puzzle. Yeah, for sure. And if, if we're gonna do a tax rate at some point, we're, we're just trying to get the lay of the land here so we know what we're dealing yeah. with. Okay, uh, Brad, did I see your hand? You you did and, and Dan actually kind of covered. I was just going to say I'd heard I'd heard anecdotally from business managers because I was asking what's going on um, that the uh, the the costs that they're incurring are kind of all over the place. Some are not incurring many costs right now. They anticipate that might change. Some are incurring quite a bit of costs right now. Some are seeing some savings in terms of costs of not spending, such as transportation costs and such. Others aren't. So it's. As, as Dan was saying, it's premature. It's all over the place. I don't have any any numbers, but that's just kind of a, just a it's it's up in the air right now. That's all. Okay. At some point, something's got to come down to earth, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else we should know? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, everyone i think that's it um for our joint meeting unless the ed committee wants to stay on and hear about interfund borrowing <laughs> no i think we'll we'll leave it's you exciting. but thanks so much for uh for this it was very i mean depressing but very helpful <laughs> welcome to our world <laughs> It was great having you, Phil. Yeah, yes. it was. Why don't we just permanently merge the committees? <laughs> I'm feeling the love. I don't know if you guys are. Yeah. No, we've been, well, we've been meeting with House Health and Welfare. It, if nothing else, it helps the people that are actually doing the work because they only have to do it once. once. Right. Yeah. Right. I, the thing is, although Phil, I know you're joking a little bit. This was Ann Man Waring's whole point the whole time she was in the house: get Ways and Means and Ed in the same room. Well, actually, they did that when uh, Shap Smith kind of uh, right created a, a hybrid. But yeah. Anyway, thank you nice very to much. See you all. Thank see you. All soon. Stay in touch, and we'll. Uh... Thank you.